manager of a newsroom with the demands of multiple live broadcasts every day, I don't get a chance to get away from the office very often, so my bar is pretty high when it comes to accepting public speaking engagements. But when our marketing director, Michelle O'Hara, told me I had a chance to introduce the bald futurist, I said, stop right there, I'm in. Not because I thought Steve Brown could help me and my company adjust to the fast-paced changes of technology in our business, but because as someone whose forehead is losing the battle against time, hair follicle by dwindling hair follicle, I admire someone who can simultaneously look good with a shaved head and enhance their personal brand all at the same time. <laughs> Very impressive, Steve. But let's get to the other half of Steve Brown's brand, the futurist part. When I think of what a futurist does, I think of my favorite TV show growing up, Star Trek. The year was 1966, but writers were already imagining a future Captain Kirk using a small handheld wireless device to communicate with his ship in orbit. And Dr. McCoy had this small black box that somehow carried all of the known medical knowledge in the universe. And today, you don't even need two devices for all of that. All you need is your smartphone. Often, the future is right in front of you if you know where to look. When Reed Hastings first got the idea for Netflix in 1997, there were around 4,000 blockbusters around the world renting DVDs, and the term streaming service hadn't even entered our lexicon yet. But the streaming technology that was the key to his business plan wasn't quite there yet, so he started with DVDs by mail. Anybody remember the Netflix queue that you had? And when that technology caught up to his ambitions, he launched the streaming service that has now disrupted the way movies and TV shows are not only consumed by all of you, but also how they are created in Hollywood. Meanwhile, the last blockbuster left in the world sits about 17 miles south of here in Bend, where tourists now flock to take selfies in front of that quaint antiquity where their parents or older cousins used to get their movies. So Reed Hastings saw the future, and he turned that vision into a media giant. That's the power of knowing the future, and that's why you will want to listen to closely to today's speaker, because he's going to drop some serious future knowledge on you, and what you do with that knowledge is up to all of you. As the former futurist and chief evangelist at Intel Corporation, Steve Brown has over 30 years of experience in high tech, half of that spent in strategic planning. And now, as an independent futurist, Steve is a speaker, author, strategist, and advisor. He holds a Bachelor of Science and Master of Engineering degrees in Microelectronic Systems Engineering from Manchester University. But now he lives in Portland, where he runs his own speaking and consulting business under the brand Bald Futurist. Please join me in welcoming the Bald Futurist, Steve Brown. Thank you, Curtis. Hi, everybody. How are you? How's that microphone sound? Okay. We didn't do a mic check, so I just want to make sure it sounds okay in the back. So thanks for coming to spend some time. I hope we're going to have a good time today. Um, I brought a rag bag of stuff for you, and we got a bit of feedback, which I'm sure they're going to work on. Um, if I stand back, is that helpful? All right. So I brought a bunch of stuff. Um, my goal is that you're going to come away from today uh, inspired, I hope. That's one of my goals. Slightly scared, probably, is an outcome. Uh, but hopefully you're going to have a lot of fun, and you're going to go away thinking about how six technologies that I'll talk to you about are going to reshape every business, including yours. Nobody escapes from this, uh, this change. And how you're going to embrace that as a way to propel your business forward, because this is a time of incredible change, which means incredible opportunity. And that's opportunity for everybody in this room. I love coming to Central Oregon. I'm a regular visitor. I live in Portland, but... You know, it's Portland. Um, it's not Central Oregon. So I'm in Redmond Bend area uh, probably two or three times a year for fun and then doing speaking gigs on top of that. So I love this part of the world. I can just feel how vibrant it is. Um, and so it's, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here today uh, talking to you all about what the future is going to hold, not just for the world, but specifically for this area. So I'm writing a book at the moment. That's why I might look a bit tired. Um, the title of that book is The Innovation Ultimatum. And what I'm going to show you today is sort of a, a quick summary of a lot of the stuff that's going to be in that book, which is going to come out early next year. Before we take a journey into the future, though, it's probably worth just taking a moment to remember how far we have come. Because only 12 years ago, less than 12 years ago, none of us had these things in our pockets and purses. 
right? That, that changed in, in a, just a decade. I want you to look at the logos on this slide here. Think about, these are the brands, services, technologies that in many ways have come to uh, characterize modern life. So think about which ones of these technologies, brands, services are part of your life. Now you can tell from my English accent that I'm not from round these here parts. <laughs> so I moved to Oregon in 1997. When I moved to Oregon in 1997, none of these companies, brands, technology, services existed. So all that's happened in just 22 years. So just a generation, all of this happened. What I'm gonna show you in the next hour or so is what's gonna happen in the next 10 years. It's gonna be a lot more than all of that stuff. So the, the pace of change is accelerating. I expect we'll see more change in the next 10 years than certainly the last 20, maybe the last 50. So buckle up, here we go. It's worth probably explaining what a futurist is. Um, so if you, I, I don't sit in a darkened room and smoke lots of peyote and come up with amazing thoughts. That's not the way it works. <laughs> I, I was trained at Intel to think 10 years in the future, 10 to 15 years in the future. So it is a process of looking at the intersections of a number of different trends. Specifically, it's three really big trends. The first one, of course, is technology. Uh, we know that that shapes a lot of our lives and the way that we live them today. So, of course, I look at technology trends. That's what you'd expect, and we'll talk a lot about that today. But that's not enough. You also have to think about business trends. How are businesses shaped by these technologies? How are they going to use them to serve customers in different ways? Uh, how will businesses pay for those technologies? So, you know, for example, the shift to the service model, SaaS uh, technology, for example. So, very important things to think about, but most importantly, it's people trends. What do people want? So when I was one of Intel's two futurists, my boss was a cultural anthropologist. And she taught me to always look at the, the world through the lens of technology, yes, but primarily through the lens of people. What do they want? What do they love? What are they scared about? What are their relationships? What are their aspirations in life? And to look at the intersection of technology, business trends, and people trends, and at those you find an intersection that tells you what the future will look like. So that's what I do, that's what a futurist does. So you're gonna see little bits and pieces of those as we go through. Now the big picture here, and this is something that's been going on for a while, this is not a new story, but this is the sort of what I'm gonna talk about is the continuation of this story, which is that the digital world that we know continues exponentially to increase in value and capability is becoming ever more intimately connected to the digital, the physical world that we all live in. So more value can stream from the left-hand side over to the right-hand side. What I want to tell you about in the next hour is that there are six technologies that are going to continue to build those bridges between the digital and the physical world, and that that will change our physical world in dramatic ways. So those six technologies are the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, blockchain, augmented reality, autonomous machines, and what I'm calling ubiquitous next generation networks, largely 5G, but also satellite communications networks. And we're gonna go through each of these one by one. We'll start with the big daddy of them all, which is artificial intelligence, and work our way through to augmented reality. As we go through these, what I'm gonna bring you is examples of how these are already showing up in a wide variety of industries. And I know that many of you here represent lots of different industries, different interests, and I've tried to just salt and pepper this with enough so that everybody gets something out of this. So if I haven't hit your industry, I'm sorry. I did my best. But we're gonna go into manufacturing, real estate, construction, agriculture, education. So it'll be little examples all the way through. So let's start off with the first one, artificial intelligence. I try and explain to people how big of a deal AI is. And the best way I've come up with is to put it in context of other big deals, big technologies that reshaped our world. The way I think about it, if you think about sort of the turn of the century, we electrified America, and that, that redefined the 20th century. So by you know, the lighting in this room, uh, the way we refrigerate our food, you know, all of that is because of electricity. And it had huge ramifications for society. About 60 years ago, 
We invented digital computers, and it took a while for them to become good enough, cheap enough, that we all had them in our homes and our pockets and purses. But they have also completely reshaped the way that we live our lives. My contention is that artificial intelligence is as big of a deal. So roughly every 60 years, something massive comes along. AI is that next thing. It will completely change the world of work. It will change the way we live our lives in our personal lives. It'll help change our interactions with each other. It will certainly change the way that every business operates. So that's why I put this first. It is a big, big, big deal. Andrew Ung, and I'll explain who he is in a moment, said, just as electricity transformed almost everything 100 years ago, today I actually have a hard time thinking of an industry that I don't think AI will transform in the next several years. Andrew Ung, is, uh, he runs his own AI company now, focused on using AI in manufacturing, called Landing.ai. He was the chief scientist at Baidu, the big, uh, massive Google equivalent over in China. And he was part of the Google Brain project that launched a lot of the AI projects that currently are coming out of Google. So he kind of knows what he's talking about. And I think he, he really summarizes nicely the way I feel about AI. So AI is a big deal. It suddenly started to become um, relevant in the early 2010s. The reason for that is you need a couple of things for AI to work. You need lots of computing capability. Turns out that the graphics chips that we use to play video games are also really good at training an AI. So suddenly, in about 2010, we had enough computing oomph to be able to make AI go. You also need lots of data. And uh, we've been giving data to Google and Facebook and all the other tech companies by giving them our photographs and videos for a decade. And they turned that around and, and train, used that data to train these AIs. This is the different thing about AI versus digital computing. With traditional digital computers, you program them. You write programs, apps. With AI, you don't write programs. You train an AI by showing it examples. It has a, a structure that's much more similar to the human brain and a neural network. And it learns over time from examples. And you have to give it millions of examples. But eventually, it will learn to do tasks. What this means is AI can solve problems, business problems, that traditional digital computers could not. So it solves a completely different set of problems. The two will coexist side by side. What it means is things that were impossible for computers just a few years ago are now within their grasp. So the question is, what can AI do? Now the answer is, well, lots of things. So what I've found is helpful is to group it into buckets. And I found that there are sort of eight buckets that are a useful way of thinking about what are the things that AI can do. So I'll walk you through them one by one, and then we'll, we'll look at a few examples. So the first thing you can do, I'll go down and step and point to it. First thing you can do is it's enabling computers to have the ability to open their eyes, to see the world for the first time. So this is machine vision. It's a huge breakthrough, and it's what is going to enable cars to drive themselves. Uh, it's going to enable robots to safely coexist in the same spaces as us, because they can now see us. Secondly, it is giving computers the ability to understand our language, to communicate with us in, in language, uh, whether that's typed, written, uh, or something that is spoken. So it's giving us a voice interface. So computers are getting mouths and ears. Third thing, and we'll get into this a little bit later in the presentation, uh, I've started calling this notion super sensing. This is not just giving computers the ability to see and hear, but to see the world more completely than we can see it. And so it's a tool for helping us to see the world more completely. And Curtis will get to Star Trek, I promise, but this is a story that starts with Star Wars and ends with Star Trek, so that's why you got Yoda on there. So this is one of my fun, favorite stories to tell, so I'm saving it sort of later in the presentation. Fourth thing that AI does, you see on here there's a picture of a guy with a big bursting gut. If I push mine out, you can see how splendid that looks. <laughs> so many people have jobs where um, they are rewarded for using their gut to make decisions, right? If you think about a fashion designer who's picking the colors for 2021 summer 
uh, colors, they're just pulling that out of their butts. I mean, they, they make that up. If they're right 50% of the time, they're heroes, right? Gut decisions. Gut decisions are going to be replaced by AI because they will make higher quality gut decisions by looking at more and more data in a way that humans cannot. Um, AI is being used to explore and discover new things, um, to be able to help us find new pharmaceuticals, new materials, and so on. I'll talk about that to make predictions about the future. This is fundamentally what AI is good at doing, looking at lots of data, finding patterns, and predicting what, what might happen next. I'll give you a good example with mosquitoes in a moment. Learning from experience. Um, AI is good at solving problems that we don't know how to solve. By doing a process of trial and error, and then learning from that, it's a process called reinforcement learning. And I'll give you an example of a robot hand that is learning to manipulate a cube uh, just by practicing. And finally, and this is the area that I think is really interesting, um, AI is going to become a partner to us all. And it is able to now have some level of an imagination to create content or to co-create content in partnership with humans. So I'll give you examples of that. So those are the, the eight things that at least today I see that AI can do. And these have huge ramifications for every single business. Let me give you a few examples. Here's one from agriculture. This is a robot called a Ripper. Uh, Ripper is uh, an experimental robot, and it can roam through a field. And because it can see, it can see the difference between a head of lettuce and a weed. And so as it roams through the field, it just zaps the weeds. Very simple application of machine vision. Here's a slightly more complex example of machine vision. This is a pepper picker. It's actually quite difficult to say that. <laughs> it's actually quite difficult to, to pick a pepper. Um, <laughs> you know where I'm going with that. <laughs> and because you have to know whether it's ripe enough, and this robot is able to figure out how to pick a ripe pepper. So let me show you a short video so you can see what that looks like. Peppers are scanned by looking slightly upwards. By observing the bottom part of the pepper, maturity can easily be detected. So there you go, now you know. Look at the bottom of the pepper and you can tell how mature it is. So that's a much more complex example of machine vision being used to manipulate a robot, allow it to assess whether a pepper is ripe or not, and then pick it and stick it in a basket. Here's an example from the manufacturing world. I mentioned uh, Andrew Ng earlier and his company Landing.ai. He has created a, an AI QA, so a quality assurance AI that can inspect items and uh, only by being shown just six examples, some good, some bad, it can spot, do visual defect uh, spotting on the production line. So sort of complementing uh, humans working on, on QA. Intel has been working with security services, uh, specifically this is an example in the London Tube, uh, where they are looking for people who are leaving luggage behind. So what it does is it can spot a person, it can understand what is a person, what's luggage, and it can spot associations between them. And so once the gap opens up between them, it will then identify that a piece of luggage has been abandoned and therefore is a potential security risk. How many of you have been to Seattle and been one to, to one of the Amazon Go stores? For those of you who have not been, you should go. It's really fun. Um, Amazon, their first store was in... Um, First Amazon Go store was in downtown Seattle, not far from the Amazon campus. They're now planning to build 3,000 of these around the country. And the experience is you walk into the store, you scan a special barcode on your phone, you put your phone away in your pocket, that's it. You walk into the store, you grab whatever items you want, you can change your mind, put them back on the shelves, doesn't matter. And as you walk out, there's no checkout, it just automatically bills you. Now, as a futurist, I walk in the store, the first thing I do is look upwards, and it's just rippling with sensors and cameras and AI that's hidden in there. But it is able to very accurately 
tell what you've taken and bill you as you walk out of the store. It feels like you're stealing, it's awesome. <laughs> but this is one of the ways that you know, small corner stores are going to be revolutionized because they will no longer need a cashier. Here's a really fun example. This is a, a, a company that is a collaboration of Bill Gates, Airbus, a couple of other people, SoftBank. They are planning to put a network of satellites in the air which will essentially give us Google Earth in real time, or near real time, like a second delay. But obviously there's some small privacy issues involved with doing that. <laughs> so what they're doing is they're using AI as a filter on the output, so there's very high, you know, powerful cameras in there. Um, Tony was talking about this earlier, about you know, military satellites. These are incredibly powerful uh, video cameras up in these satellites. They're in low Earth orbit, so there's, and there's plenty of them, so there'll be, always be one overhead. But they built AI, machine learning capability, into the satellites themselves. So the output of the satellites, you better load an app onto these satellites, and they will look for things that you want to look for. I'll give you a couple of examples. First one, if you're into tracking whales, this will watch and track whale migration because it will spot them when they surface for water, for, for air, and then track where they go over time. We're not really sure where whales go a lot of the time, but this will be able to do whale migration. You think, well, okay, that sounds interesting, but it doesn't really change my life. <laughs> well, here in Oregon, we have a small issue, particularly in the last few years, with things catching fire in the summertime. This satellite will be incredibly useful for spotting forest fires. Because if, if lightning strikes or someone tosses a cigarette butt and it starts a fire, you want to spot that as quickly as you can, especially if it's in the middle of nowhere, so that you can have the fire services go and start to deal with it before it becomes a million acre fire. So this satellite will be constantly 24-7 scanning the whole planet looking for fire starts and lightning strikes completely transforming the way that we're able to watch for those specific issues. And beyond forest fire detection, it can do asset tracking. It will track all of the, uh, the shipping in the oceans, all of the planes in the sky. Uh, it's going to be a tool for law enforcement, for volcanologists tracking uh, volcanoes. It's an incredible tool. And each of these is basically an app that runs on top of that satellite. Let's give you an example of machine vision from a medical perspective, um, being able to do virtual biopsies. If you spot them and treat them early, before it metastasizes, melanoma has a 92% survival rate. Being able to create an app that you can use to just check out that dodgy looking mole is, is almost here. And these AIs are as good as dermatologists at spotting a lot of these simple melanoma type of issues. So we're going to be able to use these tools to complement uh, human um, expertise. This is uh, an AI that listens for one particular sound in the forest. It listens for the sound of a chainsaw. So if it hears a chainsaw, it can report to the uh, forest, what are they called, ranger? Forest ranger, there may be potential logging, uh, illegal logging happening in this area. So it just listens for one particular sound. So talking of, of listening for things, how many of you have used one of these? Just want to show our hands. Quite a few, okay. So th they still kind of suck, but they're getting a lot better, right? The last couple of years, they've started to get a lot better. What I'm here to tell you is that this is going to change dramatically in the next couple of years. The capabilities of these uh, voice agents is going to become so good within maybe the next five years that you may not be able to tell at times when you're talking to a, a human being or a robot agent. Let me show you a, a video that was released by Google uh, earlier this month that shows you where they're thinking of going with this. Hey Google, book a table for two at El Cocotero on Tuesday at 7. All right, just in case that's not available, can I try between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m.? Sure. All right, I'll call to book under your name and phone number and I'll update you in the next 15 minutes. Is that okay? Perfect, thanks. El Cocotero, how may I help you? Hi, I'm the Google Assistant calling to make a reservation for a client. Um, this automated call will be recorded. Can I book a table for Tuesday the 12th? Okay, cool. And how big is the party? 
It's for two people. Great. And when did you say they want to come in? Um, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Okay, let me check. Mm-hmm. I don't have 7, but we can do 8. Yeah, 8 p.m. is fine. Perfect. And can I get their name? Uh, first name is Anna. Okay. We'll see you on a Tuesday. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot. That's not faked. That's real technology today, working today. And that's only going to get better. So it's going to become much more conversational. Uh, have much more capability, and voice agents are going to be the personal assistants that we would all love to have if we could afford to have one, right? So these are going to be able to run errands on our behalf, take care of things for us. Um, and if you have customer support uh, in, your, in your companies, this is where the future of customer support, at least the first line of customer support. As well as being able to understand spoken language, AIs can also now understand written language. In particular, they can start to recognize data that's not in a standard format. So if, you have, if you're doing a lot of data entry, AI can, if once it sees enough forms, it can start to figure out, well, that's a date of birth, that's a social security number, that's an address, that's a name, <laughs> suck all the data in, even on a form that's not a standard format. So for automating data entry, uh, AI is going to do a, an incredible job. Depending on where you are in the world, you may need to speak lots of different languages, especially as it's become more of a melting pot in this country. This is a set of headphones. They're a special head set of headphones. They pair with your phone. They allow you to hear and speak 15 languages for like $2.99. I bought these on Kickstarter a couple of years ago. I speak French as well. I lived in France when I was a kid. And so I tried them out when I first got them. And you know, you put them in your ears and you speak into your phone in one language, and it comes into your ears in the language you want, which was English. So I spoke into French in my phone, and it comes straight back into my ears in English. I tried everything. I tried all the bad words. Because, <laughs> you know, you do. All the slang, perfect. So that's where we're at with, with real-time uh, translation. Google just announced uh, their Translatotron this week, uh, which it's early days, and it's, it doesn't work very well yet. But they're not only able to take what you say and then speak it in a different language, but now to, set, to hear what you say, speak it in a different language in your voice. Big breakthrough. I promised you a story about mosquitoes, so here we go. Uh, if you live in uh, Asia, dengue fever is a big, is a big risk. It's a big deal. Um, they spend about $300 million a year in Asia on mosquito suppression. And knowing where the mosquitoes are going to start to try and breed uh, allows you to focus your efforts. So an AI was created that took in hundreds of factors, 276 variables into account, to predict where dengue fever might break out to allow the authorities to focus their efforts on suppressing uh, mosquitoes. What they found was that the AI could predict an outbreak of dengue fever three months in advance. It could do that to within a 400-meter range and do it with 80% accuracy. Wow. So if you can solve that problem, predict those kinds of things, what other things might we predict using AI? Here's a few examples. Here's one from the healthcare world. Predicting cardiovascular health risk. To do that today requires a blood draw. Uh, you, you draw blood and you can tell um, what someone's risk of heart attack and stroke might be. You can do exactly the same level, the same quality of prediction by just looking at the retina of someone's eye. And using uh, machine learning, uh, looking at the, the retina, you can predict someone's risk of heart attack and stroke as accurately as a blood draw. If you're in the financial world, uh, particularly in mortgages, figuring out who to give a loan to can be challenging, and, and underwriters look at lots of different factors to decide, is this somebody that is going to repay the loan or not? AI is actually also pretty good at doing that. And companies like underwrite.ai and Zest Finance, they claim that you can successfully loan to a different set of people who you would normally not lend to, but who are still good risks, because the AI looks at a lot more factors and finds groups of people that are still good risks, but wouldn't traditionally qualify for a mortgage loan. 
I promised you a robot hand earlier. This is a project that's run by a, a group called OpenAI. AI. Um, dexterity, the things you can do with your hand, where you can wiggle your fingers about, like this is really hard for a robot to do. Figuring out how to pick up objects and manipulate them is an incredibly difficult task. And if you've watched a two-year-old grapple with bricks, you know that it takes them a long while to learn out how to do that. This is a project that used reinforcement learning and a simulation. They simulated uh, the hand and the robot in a, in a software simulation for 100 years equivalent of manipulating this object. And eventually, it learned to do this. And yes, it's really creepy. I just wanted to show you that this is one of the forefronts of robotics, and AI is already helping to solve some of those difficult problems. I told you that AI is also starting to get an imagination. This is something that Google showed a couple of years ago, a demo of, of an AI being used to strip the foreground occlusion, in this case, a, sh a chain link fence, out of an image. To do that, it has to use its experience of many, 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 many photographs to be able to imagine what would be the colors of the pixels behind the black ones it removes from the foreground. Even another example of AI being used to imagine content. This is a similar example. Uh, this is a, a new tool that's part of Photoshop. It's called Context Aware Fill. It uses AI to imagine what would be behind when they remove that B, the shot on the left, to imagine, based on its understanding of what an image looked like, and the shape of the flower to be able to put in all of those extra bits that were behind the bee. It imagines those shapes. Let me show you another experimental AI. This is coming from NVIDIA. This is an AI painting tool. Now, you're going to hear people kind of muttering in the background. Eventually, you'll hear someone talking. But I wanted to show you, this is a tool where you say, I want this area to be the ground, this area is water, this is sky. Make me a photograph. Here's what it looks like. Let's click on the rock, and then we can replace the mountain. And let's try waterfalls by pulling water down from the top there. Okay. Wouldn't it be great if everybody could be an artist? If we could take our ideas and turn them into compelling images? This technology allows us to create a smart paintbrush so that if you wanted to create a new picture, you can just draw the shapes of the objects that you want, and the neural network can then fill in all the details. If we add a water feature, the network is able to add reflections, not because we told it that, but because it learned it. Or if we change the ground to be covered in snow, then it knows that the sky also needs to be a different color. I really think this technology is going to be great for architects, designers, people making virtual worlds to train robots and self-driving cars. So what I'm showing you there is examples of AI technology that's starting to work in partnership with a human to create content together. Now, the way that's done is with a technology called generative adversarial networks. You don't need to remember that. It doesn't matter. There's not a test afterwards. But you'll hear about these GANs uh, over the next several years, I guarantee it. Now, the way it works is it's two AIs that work together. And the way you can think of it, one's called a generator that makes content. The other one's called a discriminator, which is trained on what content should look like. And they work together till eventually the generator makes really good content. It's a bit like a forger and an art detective working in cahoots. So one AI trains the other until eventually they're able to create amazing looking content. Let me give you an example. This is a, a generative adversarial network that's been used to create, they're not photographs, but what look like photographs of models wearing clothing. You can see here, they look quite realistic. And you can start to do things like, well, what if I made the, short, the, the sleeves shorter? What if I made the, the fabric different? Or if I made them stand in a different pose. All of this, these are not real people. These are not real photographs. They're not real clothing. They're automatically generated by the AI. So AI generated people. Let me show you now how good the technology is. I'm about to show you a video of AI generated faces.
So we're moving to a bit of an era where seeing will no longer be believing, which is all kinds of worries. Uh, when we live in a world of disinformation and fake news, it's kind of problematic. But it is going to be a tool that allows creative people to create more and to create in partnership with an AI. My guess is that a decade from now, everybody in this room, including me, if you're still working, you're going to be working in partnership with an AI to do at least some of the tasks that you do, to create content. Let me give you another example from the design and manufacturing world. I spend a lot of time with folks from Autodesk who make computer-aided design tools. Uh, they have a big office in, in Portland. And one of the things that they've been looking at is this notion of generative design, where an AI works in partnership with a human designer to create designs. Now, if you were designing an angle bracket, you might create something that looks like this on the left here. It's obviously a very human uh, designed uh, product. If you let an AI loose on this, because it's able to use 3D printing technology and design things in a way that is different than a human would design it, it comes up with something that looks more like this. It looks like something from Alien, right? It's, it's organic looking because evolution and um, nature designs in much the same way. It, through trial and error, it tries and it finds ways that are more efficient. And in this example, that uh, angle bracket on the right there is cheaper to make, lighter weight, and physically stronger than the one on the left. Pretty amazing, right? Let me show you a short video. This is from the former CTO of Autodesk, uh, talking about why generative design is so important and how it will change the manufacturing world. But what if instead of drawing what you already know, you could tell the computer what you want to accomplish? For example, say I want to design a chair. Instead of drawing a chair and then playing with the form, I could instead tell the computer that I wanted a chair that can support this much weight, weigh this much, and cost this much, and produce something based on the material that I've chosen. The computer can then deliver to me thousands, if not millions, of design options, all of which meet those criteria. And from those options, I can pick the one design that delivers on the most important criteria. And the one that I select might not even have been one that I could have imagined on my own. That's the promise of generative design. But why is it important? It's an entirely new way of doing things, and the benefits are potentially staggering. Unprecedented reductions in costs, development time, material consumption, the sky's the limit. And when we combine generative design with the emergence of new forms of manufacturing like 3D printing, we suddenly have access. Traditional manufacturing methods require you to make massive numbers of something just in order to be profitable. Small designers without access to production resources were simply out of luck. But now we can do a batch run of just one. The stage is being set for the re-emergence of local manufacturing. What does this mean for the designer? Now they will co-create with the technology, choosing the constraints and setting the goals. The software simply determines the most optimized way of achieving those goals. It's going to lead to astounding results. And that's generative design. So my guess is that that's an example for design and manufacture, is that every one of us will be using this type of technology to do what they do. The presentation I'm showing today is probably hundreds of hours of my work to get it to be this. I can't wait for an AI to help me to kind of semi-auto-generate my presentations five years from now, 10 years from now. This is even being used in the medical world. So um, let me give you an example. How many of you have here have a crown? So much fun, right? Now, you, didn't, you might not know this, but your dentist probably designed that crown on a CAD machine in an office somewhere. There's an AI now that can take scans of your jaw and automatically, generatively, design that crown so that the dentist can spend more time in your mouth getting billable dollars than designing crowns on a CAD, on a CAD system. So this will be a technology that will create all kinds of things including writing contracts, write, ultimately writing software code, uh, working in partnership with programmers, so they don't actually have to write code anymore. The AI will auto-generate it based on what they say. Now, we have come to the end of the AI section. How do you all feel? A little crappy? Yeah? Uh, so here's what I want to say. It is jarring 
You know, I live in this world, I'm used to it, and I still find it a little bit freaky. Because we're creating a technology that is now starting to encroach on things that we think are uniquely us, uniquely human. But we should welcome this because there are probably people in this room or, or people in this room with children whose lives will be saved by an AI that discovers a drug that will save their life. So we should continue to welcome AI. Uh, it is a little weird, um, especially, you know, it can be a little worrying when we watch too many uh, sci-fi movies. But let me give you some context here. There's sort of three types of AI. There's narrow AI, which is every AI on the planet today is a narrow AI, which means it's good at doing one thing and one thing only. The AI behind you, Alexa, is good at listening to your voice. That's it. That's all it can do. The AI that is behind a chess player, chess machine, is good at playing chess. It cannot do what Alexa does, and Alexa cannot do what the chess machine does. Right? They're good at doing one thing and one thing only. So while they seem brilliant, they can only do one thing. We are decades away from the next step of AI, which is called general AI. So general AI is when you create an AI that can do pretty much everything that a human being could do at the level of a human being, reasoning and capability and creativity and so forth. Beyond that is the one that everybody worries about, which is super AI. <laughs> and super AI is where an AI can do everything that a human can do, but can do it better and faster. And at that point, you could create an AI that then generates another AI, and you get this runaway effect. Should we be afraid of that? No, we should be cautious in the way that we develop AI, of course, but there's a difference between caution and fear. AI is gonna change every business, it's gonna change all, our, all of our lives, and for the better. So my, get, my, my request to you is try and be open-minded to this, don't panic, don't be afraid, it's a natural posture to, to adopt. Be cautious, ask questions, but this is an exciting time to be alive. This is gonna change uh, the way a lot of us do a lot of things. So be thinking, what is your artificial intelligence strategy in your company? If you don't have one, you need to start thinking about that like last week. Okay. All right, let's get on to autonomous machines. You take AI, you put it into a machine, allow it to control that machine, you get an autonomous machine. This is everything from self-driving cars to robots to drones and so on. So let's leap in. Classically, this is what robots look like. They built our cars, they lived in factories, uh, they made things, and they were, they were trapped inside cages. The reason they're inside cages is they couldn't see humans, and therefore they couldn't safely be in the same space as us. With AI's ability to do machine vision and, and super sensing, that's now not the case. This is what robots look like today. Um, I used to show lots of separate videos of robots, and I decided it was taking too long. I used to have a video editing background, so I put together a short sort of video montage of all the robots I think are interesting. I've not shown this to anybody yet, so you're the first audience to see it today, so I hope you enjoy it.
So the robots are definitely coming. In fact, in many cases, the robots are already here. And they are in every, I work lots of different sectors of business. They're in every single sector. I'll give you just a few examples of what you just saw there. This is the Atlas that you saw from Boston Dynamics. Um, you know, it's a pretty capable robot compared to what we had just a few years ago. This is another one that they have called Handle, which they're aiming to work in warehouses. And there's a whole category of robots that are becoming called cobots. A cobot is designed to collaborate with humans, so it's a collaborative robot, a cobot. It's estimated in the future maybe up to 25% of robots will be cobots, specifically designed to work in partnership with humans. I showed you a SAM 100. This is a, a bricklaying robot. The average human bricklayer, if they're any good, can lay about 500 bricks a day. SAM 100 can lay 3,000 bricks in a day. Now, that is a partnership of human and machine working together. Let me show you what that partnership looks like. So you saw humans at the beginning loading the bricks, shoveling in the mortar, and then striking at the end. The robot does all the rest. So the robot's still messy. He can't do the striking himself. That's why you need the human to work on that. But between them, as a team, six times as many bricks in a day. You saw Hadrian in there. Hadrian can essentially 3D print a home. This is a technology in Australia. And if you want to do drywall, well, here's a drywall bot for you. This is out of the uh, Advanced Institute of Technology in Japan. It's a little slow, but he doesn't file for workers' comp. So this is still in a lab, but it gives you a feel for where this technology is going. If you have kids that are planning a career in the fast food industry, uh, this is one you might want to tell them about. Flippy, because it can see burgers, it is able to run the grill. Uh, so when I, when I worked at Intel, I, the phone ran off the hook with people from the fast food industry wanting to automate their back kitchens. This is one of the technologies they were looking at. You also saw a robot valet. that can, it doesn't, You don't need to have humans that go inside your car anymore which is a security issue, or leaving marks on your seat. It just picks up your car, takes it to a spot, and parks it. This is actually in trial now. This is at Gatwick Airport in London. And you'll see from this image, because you don't need the human being to be able to get in and out of the car, you can park them a lot closer together. So it makes much more efficient use of space. You also in that video saw this robot from a Swiss company called Eco Robotics. It uses solar power to roam through fields, and you saw it both zapping weeds and also spraying them, spot spraying the weeds with chemicals. The reason I have the word 90% on there is that because instead of spraying herbicides on the field, it spot sprays on the weeds, which means it needs 90% less herbicide. This is great, of course, for stuff running into the water table, but it also saves farmers a lot of money. If you have shares in Dow Chemical, you shouldn't. <laughs> uh, Stock-taking robots. Uh, these are robots that roam through and do what, is, what takes about the humans in a store, in a grocery store, about 40% of their time is stock-taking. We need more cornflakes, more Bayer aspirin, write it all down. This roams through the store, uses 2D and 3D cameras to build that pick list. This is it uh, on, in use in Walmart stores today. Here's a warehousing robot. It can carry boxes autonomously around the, the, the warehouse. Carries up to a ton in weight. This is a warehousing forklift truck, autonomous forklift, from a company called Seagrid. So as you can see, there are just lots of different robots designed for all sorts of different industries, and they have different shapes, sizes, strengths, capabilities. Take a robot, give it the ability to fly, you get a drone. 
as you can see here, drones are a lot more powerful than they used to be. Here, you're able to pull um, a grown man through the water, but you can use them for all kinds of interesting tasks. And my guess is these are going to be real workhorses in a lot of industries in the future. Here's an example from construction. So construction drones are being used to do everything on work sites from surveying the area to making sure that things are done right. You put a, a FARO laser scanner on one of these things, and it can compare the plans with what you've actually built and measure to within a millimeter. So that, I mean, not up to 10%, maybe sometimes more, of construction costs are related to fixing all the screw-ups. So to be able to measure things and figure out problems early on so that you can intercept them quickly and fix them early will save a lot of cost in construction. And you're going to see drones on construction sites doing safety monitoring, making sure people have their helmets on, making sure they have protective glasses, uh, all kinds of things. So they have a huge role in construction. Drones are also becoming able to interact with the physical world. So this is an example of a drone with arms. It's actually being used to um, uh, do safety at uh, swimming pools, to drop, to watch for people in the pool, and if they need help, to go and drop them um, a floaty. I don't know how tech companies come up with their names. Sometimes they're good, often they're really bad. Here's a great example of that. This is the flirty drone. <laughs> Why they came up with that name, I don't know. This is a drone that will get you um, an AED. So if you, if you have a heart attack, and 350,000 people in the United States have out-of-hospital heart attacks each year. In some cases, you don't need, you, know, you don't need to be zapped, but many of you do. And if you don't get zapped, you die. Now, the story here is that um, a similar product to this uh, in Sweden, they did trials with uh, these defibrillator drones. If you have an out-of-hospital heart attack and you need an AED and you don't get one, every minute that passes after your heart attack, your chances of survival drop by 10%. So after 10 minutes, mm -mm, game over. My dad had a heart attack three months ago. He's fine. But, and he didn't need an AED, but it really made this personal for me. This trial in Sweden, what they did was they would send out the, the drone at the same time as the ambulance, and they timed how quickly did they get to the heart attack victim. So they have put the drone in the air and off it went. What they found was the average difference in time, the drone would get there 16 minutes faster. When you've got 10 minutes until you die, that's kind of a big deal. So drones are going to be a big, a big uh, part of uh, a quick you know, first response in the future. If you're not sure what to get your errant niece or nephew for Christmas, <laughs> this is my best idea for you. This is a flamethrower drone. This is actually used by energy companies in China. Uh, if they get debris on the power lines, rather than send somebody up in a cherry picker, they just burn it off. Now, right now, these are uh, uh, controlled by a person on the ground, but there's no reason why ultimately they couldn't be autonomous and live on the power lines, recharge themselves from the power lines, roam along, look for debris, and just aut autonomously take care of all of that. If you can set fire to stuff with a drone, you can put out things with a drone too. So this is a firefighting drone. Again, this is controlled by a firefighter on the ground, but ultimately, this could become autonomous and work in partnership with the human firefighters as they battle the fire. Here's another example. This is a firefighting drone in China uh, that is designed specifically for tower blocks. And it can fire, pro or shoot projectiles uh, in through a window, which then explode and put out a fire uh, by sucking all the oxygen out of the air. Pretty cool. Lots of drones in the agricultural sector. Um, all kinds of uses here, anything from spraying the crops uh, to surveying the land, figuring out where you need to, you know, there might be blight, where you might need to water more, where there are drainage issues. Uh, so this is a nice complement to satellite data. And there are even companies, there's a company called Drone Seed, which is using these things to seed um, in forestry areas. So in you know, really, um, it's hard to see in this picture, but in very steep environments where you, it's very hard to get humans in there. They will go with these seeds, it's like a paintball gun, and it fires these pellets into the ground, and the pellets have a seed and some nutrients to help the tree uh, with its first uh, few, few days of life. 
So drones to do all kinds of things. There are even drones for dogs. <laughs> now, I always tell people, any presentation, you should always have at least one puppy. So this is today's puppy. If you can make a drone for a dog, surely you could scale it up and make a drone for humans, right? Turns out there are over 100 companies that are racing to be the first to get to market with passenger drones. I picked the most viable ones that I think are there, like 22 companies or so, but look at the names here. Airbus, Boeing, Embraer, Uber, and behind a lot of these startups is money from Toyota, Volvo. How, how long do you think until we have the first passenger drones? Any guesses? They're here already, yeah. They're here in trial already. First flights, first services that people will be able to use within five years, probably more like three to four. I was at the Consumer Electronics Show earlier this year. This is the Bell Nexus. Uh, carries four passengers plus a pilot. Ultimately, they have aimed to be fully autonomous. And in Dubai, next year, they're planning to put drone bikes in the market for police officers. So imagine your next speeding ticket from one of these. So what we're talking about here is this is the beginnings and part of a much broader change in transportation for humanity. So we used to get around with horse and carriage, right, 100 years ago. And then we had the internal combustion engine. We got the horseless carriage. We are now on the edge of moving to the horseless driverless carriage. We're moving from a product that you own to a service that you use. And from a largely hardware product to a largely software product. And by going autonomous, it is going to change the way that we all get around. It means we'll be able to do something else rather than driving. It means that people who can't drive today, for whatever reason, will now have access to personalized transportation. So if you're too old, too young, you can't see, you, you're too drunk to drive, right? all these reasons, now you have access to do that. And it's become a race for all of the car companies to make sure that they stay in the game. Because if in a rural community, are you going to get rid of your car? No. In cities, are you? Maybe. Or maybe you're going to go from being a three-car family to a two-car family. Because you'll supplement it with on-demand services. And the car companies know that. And they know that by 2030, that's when this really starts to take off. Why is this important? One and a quarter million people die every year in car accidents, almost half of those pedestrians. 93% of car accidents are caused by human error. So if we can eliminate that, we could save literally millions of people's lives. Now, if you're not driving when you're on the go, you can start to do other things. And you'll start to rent a car that is based on what you want to do in your journey. You want a movie car? Great, kick back and relax. Watch some Netflix, watch a movie you wanted to watch. You have to do a business meeting with a video conference? Get the business car. And as well as creating these mobile platforms that move us to things, they will also start to morph to be able to bring things to us. Here's an example of a trial that's happening in uh, Shanghai. Now, I can see you're all big clubbers, big nightclubbers here. So imagine the scenario, you stumble out of the nightclub at 2 a.m. in Shanghai, of course you've got the munchies, you pull out your phone, you summon the autonomous mobile store. The store trundles its way through the night to you, it lets you into the store, you pick out your items, just like Amazon Go. You scan them to buy them, slightly different model, but similar, there's no uh, shopkeeper there. And when you're done, the store just goes off into the night to find another customer. What this means is you can start to think about these platforms as a way to project your brand and your business and take services to people rather than expecting them to come to you. Here's an example in California. This is a mobile grocery store from a company called Robomart. And some companies are already imagining mobile hotel rooms, mobile clinics to connect rural communities, and rural transportation to be able to connect communities to um, services. If you can make autonomous cars, you can make autonomous trucks. All of the major truck companies are working to make trucks autonomous. 
the number one job in Oregon, in fact, the number one job in 29 out of our 50 states, is driver. This is going to change the uh, work landscape. This is a company called Starship Technologies. Uh, they are creating a delivery robot that can trundle down the sidewalk. This is on trial in London. Um, navigates its way around people, and then comes to your front door and delivers goods to you. A short video, but I'm going to slip by it just for the sake of time. There are lots of these delivery robots, and they're aiming to change delivery forever so that the cost of delivery, one hour delivery, will become one dollar. That changes the game for every business. This one's a really cool one. A company called Continental um, has been working with another company called Animal to create this notion where this cube rocks up, and then these robot dogs stream out and deliver packages. These robot dogs can climb your front porch and ring your doorbell and deliver packages. I saw a demonstration of it at the Consumer Electronics Show in January. So be thinking about how autonomous machines are going to change your business. Talk about the Internet of Things. I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Um, Internet of Things, this is an idea that computing and, and uh, connectivity goes into everything. It's happening because computing is going to be getting very cheap and very small. This is a $5 computer that has the same computing capabilities as a laptop from the early mid-90s. And computers are getting very small. This is not as capable as a computer, but in this photograph, it is resting on the edge of a one-cent coin. Going even smaller, on the right-hand side here, you see a silicon sliver that is smaller than, the gra than a grain of salt. For those of you who are old enough to remember, the 486 microprocessor. So 486 PCs in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. This has about that same performance, but it'll cost less than 10 cents in production. So you can think about intelligence and connectivity as something you can stir into all your products and ingredients. Fundamentally, the Internet of Things is about sensors, allowing the digital world to understand what is happening in the physical world. And there are going to be, by the estimates of SAP anyway, by 2030, which is just 11 years from now, 100 trillion sensors in the world. And sensors, everything from moisture sensors, temperature sensors, cameras, microphones, even a Wi-Fi hotspot can become a sensor. And you think, well, how does that work? Well, Starbucks in China, they use uh, the Wi-Fi hotspot as a way to count how many people are in the store. When you walk into, even if you don't connect to the Wi-Fi hotspot, your phone is still pinging to see if it can find a connection. So even if you don't connect, the Wi-Fi hotspot can see your phone. One phone, one person, usually. So it counts how many phones it can see and therefore how many people are in the store. They use that information to choose the music. If the store is kind of quiet, get a Sinatra. Chill out. Order another cup of tea or coffee, maybe a piece of cake. If the store is busy, they turn up the volume and turn up the tempo to get people in and out. Money, money, money. This has had material impact on their business results just by using the Wi-Fi hotspot to count people in real time. It also enables you to do things like measuring rather than modeling risk. If you're in the insurance business, this is why uh, these connected smoke detectors from Google are so interesting to insurance companies because they, can now, they know that there is a smoke detector that is working and functioning, switched on, battery backup, in that home. So they can now model, they can now measure the level of risk rather than, well, do you think they go put the batteries in? Do you think it's connected? Now they know for sure. Sensors are also getting smarter. And Curtis, we're getting to the point that uh, you've been waiting for with the Star Trek story. Smart sensors use AI to be able to do more than a simple sensor. So this is a simple example of a sensor that's connected to a piece of manufacturing equipment, and it suggests when prevention of maintenance might need to occur, because it listens to the sound and vibrations of equipment and notices when it changes. So let's get to our Star Wars and Star Trek story. A researcher at MIT um, was fascinated with the story of Star Wars. And specifically, she was fascinated by the idea of the Force, which, as we know, surrounds us, penetrates us, binds the galaxy together, right? And she thought, wouldn't it be great if there was a Force? And then she realized, well, actually, there is a Force. It's electro electromagnetic energy. If I move my arms up and down, I am literally creating a disturbance in the Force. She thought, well, could I detect that? So she created this radio frequency sensor that's 
spews out radio frequency waves. It's about one, one hundredth the power of a Wi-Fi hotspot. And then it looks at the reflections that come back. And the reflections kind of look messy, hard to make sense of. But you can train that AI to correlate those reflections. Generally, a, a, a radio frequency goes through walls but bounces back off people. To correlate those with the input that's been trained on with a camera. What it's able to do is pull out shapes, human shapes. Let me show you a video of what they're able to do with that. For some reason, we've lost volume. All right, I'll explain what's happening. So it is uh, able to see through walls. It is able to see figures and multiple people walking around a room. And their plan is to use this in healthcare scenarios. Because not only can it see people walking around and see if they're sitting, standing, lying down, it can also measure accurately your breathing rate and your heartbeat. Just with one simple sensor. So it can get your vital signs without any wires being attached to you. So in a healthcare environment where you're looking after older people, for example, you can now monitor them for all kinds of health conditions. How many of you have had a sleep study? Yeah, it's not fun. Because they strap all these wires to you. This is me having a sleep study in 2012. I'm looking so happy because it's actually my birthday in this picture. And they put all these wires all over you and they say, okay, sleep well. You can't sleep. And so... This monitor that I just showed you, not only can it get your vital signs, it can also measure your sleep states without wires. So now, I can, with one sensor, using, RF, using an RF sensor and artificial intelligence, I can measure your motion, your vital signs, and your sleep states. Now, why is that important? A lot of these are indicators for health conditions. If you have disruptions in your deep sleep, it's an indication of depression or anxiety. If you have dis uh, disruption in your REM sleep and you start to walk in repetitive patterns, early, on, early onset Alzheimer's. If you change your gait, Parkinson's. If you fall over, obviously this thing can detect that too. So suddenly I can detect all of these healthcare conditions with one non-invasive sensor. So we started our story with Star Wars, we ended with Star Trek. Because now I've created sickbay. Remember they used to come in and lay down sickbay and then all those things would... Oh, Dr. McCoy would come in, he's going to be okay. Jim. Right? And there were no wires involved. This is exactly what we've created here. And I did this talk for the League of California Cities, and they were very interested. They have a problem with self-harm in jails. They want to be able to non-invasively monitor people in jails to make sure that if they're doing something where they might be harming themselves, they can inter intercede and save people's lives. I'm running low on time, so I'm going to speed you up. Here's a really interesting example from a Boston company called FDNA. They can use uh, artificial intelligence, a simple app on a phone connected to a bunch of stuff in the cloud that can look at the shape of a child and by seeing slight changes in the shape of the skull, predict very accurately if that child has any rare genetic conditions. Suddenly a whole new diagnostic tool for doctors. In Israel, there's a company called Beyond Verbal that listens to the sound of your voice and purely looking for biomarkers in your vocal the quality of your voice, it can predict COPD, sleep apnea, chronic heart failure, and um, arterial disease. Just by listening to the sound of your voice and how that changes with time. They also think they can project whether you're going to be hospitalized, whether you're going to die. And they think, and they're still in trials right now, they'll be able to do hypertension, diabetes, and maybe even hear cancer in your voice in the future. This is what I mean by super sensing, enabling us to see the world in more detail and more clarity than we could without AI. Here's another fun example uh, from Google, Project Soli. They're looking at radar as a way to be able to control devices in the future. Is it going to do it? Here we go. So by moving your fingers, it gets these radar reflections, and it can translate that using AI to be able to lay to control things without even touching them. How cool will that be? So how are we going to see the world more completely with these super sensors, and what will we do with them? There are lots of different ways that Internet of Things shows up in the world. I'll give you a couple of fun examples. This is a smart connected wallet. It has, uh, in the corner there, it has a variable strength hinge. It's connected to your bank account in real time. 
as your bank account dwindles, it becomes harder and harder to open your wallet. <laughs> this is an internet-connected toothbrush. You think, well, why would I want that? Because this toothbrush, this dentist gives you this toothbrush, it reports back on you. Do you brush your teeth in the morning and night? Do you get the molars? Do you brush for two minutes? If you do, the dentist gives you your dental insurance for 15 to 20% less. Now it's interesting, right? Yeah, because you're a lower risk. You can use it to create smart infrastructure, but it really ladders up to making your business smart. Let me explain what I mean by that. For every business looking forward, you need to look at all of your business processes. Usually most businesses have three to five main business processes. And break them down into, into tasks, as granular as you can go. And then ask yourself the tough question, given this palette of technology that I'm showing you, which of those tasks is best done by a person, which is best done by an AI, an algorithm, which is best done by a robot? And how do I build teams of all of those working together? Because each of them has different strengths and weaknesses. You know, leverage the creativity, the empathy of a human, mix it with the accuracy uh, and lack of bias, at least if you do it right, of an AI, and then the endurance, speed, and strength of a robot. How do you build teams out of humans and machines working together? And the sake of time, because I'm looking at time, I'm going to actually skip blockchain. Sorry if you wanted to know about blockchain, but I run out of time a little bit here, so let me zoom through this one. <laughs> Look away, talk amongst yourselves. Lots of good stuff there. Save that for another time. I'm going to wrap up quickly with, uh, with 5G and, and augmented reality. Um, 5G networks are going to be much faster than 4G networks, and we're going to complement those with satellites that mean you will have a signal all the time, everywhere you go. So even if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you will still get a signal. So we went from 2G, 3G, 4G to now 5G. It is going to be much faster, but it's going to enable all kinds of new applications, from smart cities, uh, augmented streaming, augmented reality, um, uh, industry 4.0 factories, all kinds of new capabilities. And it's because not only is it faster, it's much lower latency, meaning when you send a signal to the internet, it comes back lippity-squick. So to be able to do that, you have to put in a whole new infrastructure. It's going to take five to probably 10 years to build out. But it will be a fundamental capability that will change every business and then lay out on top of that, as I mentioned, all these satellites. You see all these different companies here that want to put up constellations of literally thousands of satellites. We probably will double the number of satellites in orbit around the Earth in the next 10 years as we go through this effort. So you're going to have global high-speed connectivity anywhere and everywhere. Let's wrap this up with augmented reality. How many of you have tried virtual reality? A few. It's kind of cool. And it, it, it immerses you in this fully digital world. And it's, it's cool, but I think the real breakthrough is augmented reality, where you're not disconnected from the physical world. You're overlaying digital information and objects. They appear as if they're in the physical space that you're in. What it means is this is the new display right here. Now, it's not there yet, but it will be. It means that your next, I don't know how big this TV is, let's say 65, 70-inch TV, is a 99-cent app in the App Store. It means that computing for the 80% of people who work with their hands is now in reach. And it's going to change our relationship with information uh, for, for all people who work with their hands, because now you're able to create an augmented worker, a combination of human and machine intelligence, where you're guided on what to do next in the moment. This enables you to start to train people in real time. If you're in the manufacturing world, you know how hard it is to bring in and retain people. You have to train them, and then they, they disappear. This will allow you to train people in the moment, in real time, day one. They'll be productive on the job. So it's already in trial a number of places. Uh, HoloLens, the platform from Microsoft, is being trialed on Volvo production lines. This technology is also going to change the way that people rescue people in smoky environments. To be able to give a firefighter an enhanced view using scanning technology and overlay that on their field of view will be able to get into a fire and out of it much more rapidly, saving lives along the way. In construction, it is going to change the way construction works as well getting away from 2D flat plans and making those 3D and interactive. I'm going to show you a short video. Conventionally, the inspection process is done manually. 
often requiring more than one person and can take a long time to document and circulate the information to others. SRI's computer-aided system can accurately track user location as they move around a large job site. With instant access to an intuitively searchable digitized database, an inspector is able to accurately align and compare what is being built against the building information model. Manual measurement processes become automated and more accurate. Capturing and documenting data become less time consuming. The inspector can snap photos on demand or add and retrieve virtual notes that stick to a location, which can be shared across multiple devices. So pretty cool. Um, this is early days. You're going to see it changed the world of education. I'm going to flip past another video again. The, the, this is early days. This is where we are in the cycle, right? Uh, we have a few more years to go. But once this comes, this will change the way we interact with digital information and services in a profound way. I kind of put it second to um, uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence. So I ran you through all of the six big technologies. Which I know we're behind time, so I'm going to go really quick on this closing thought. We are moving to a new era of work. We created mechanical muscles and moved people off working the land with the Industrial Revolution. Right, we created steam machines, mechanization, and we moved. You know, most people used to work the land. 95% of people worked the land, and now it's 3 percentish. And that allowed people to move into offices and factories, and it created all kinds of, of wealth and allowed people to live much longer, more productive lives. We are now about to create mechanical minds. What that means is we're going to automate even more physical jobs and automate a bunch of knowledge jobs as well. And that pushes us to a new era of work. And the question is, well, what is that era? I think it is the augmented era of work, where instead of technology being a tool that we tell what to do, think of a hammer, now technology creates tools that work in partnership with us, that help that work alongside us, that augment our capabilities, that help us do what we do better. And I give you examples of this throughout. Technology that collaborates in partnership with humans. Cobots, that generative AI, digital personal assistants, that augmented reality worker. Work is going to change, and we're going to see a sustained built out of these technologies. As businesses work to automate, to augment the capabilities of their human workers, to innovate their products and services, and to really just think about the way they do business differently. What it means is every business represented in this room is going to be a tech company, whether you like it or not. Because that's going to give you the advantage that allows you to do better than your competition. It also means that every business in this room is not just a tech company, but a data company. Because you're going to gather and use data to do all kinds of things, to help you with your automation, to help you train your AIs, to help you customize the experiences you give to your, to your customers and to help you innovate in new ways. And that's a whole separate presentation that I do, but that's just, I want to give you a hint on that. So be thinking fundamentally, what's my data strategy? What data do I need to gather in order to be successful? And again, that's a whole other thing that I teach. So to wrap this up, I want you to think about those six technologies I talked to you about. I know I only got to five, I'm sorry. As being a palette, as you innovate in your, in your business, think about these as new colors in the palette from which you can paint your future. Amongst those, they're not all equal, AI is the big daddy. That transforms everything. Look hard, look close at how AI will transform your business. It will transform many, many parts of it. Blockchain, we didn't get to, is a very disruptive technology, particularly in the financial, transactional, and supply chain world. If you're interested in that, I do a whole two-hour workshop on blockchain. You're not getting away from this one. Everybody in this room, including all the young ones in this room I see, welcome, very glad to have you all here. Your lives are going to be changed by this stuff. Every business is going to be transformed. Every life will be transformed by this technology. 
and we're gonna bring another four billion minds online in the next 10 years as we put all these satellites in the air and connect everybody on the planet. And that augmented era of work is already starting. Be thinking now, how do I get ready for that new work era? How do I make the most of it for my business to serve my customers in new ways, to create value in new ways? And if this is disturbing to you, there are three steps to success here. First one is, don't panic. Right? I know what I showed you is overwhelming. But the good news is, everybody's in the same boat. It's not just you. So the second thing is, don't wait. I know that, that bald English guy, it was interesting. But we, we're fine, we can wait a few years, right? Nope. You have an advantage because you have me here today. Use that advantage, don't wait. Get going on this stuff now. And you think, well, how do I, I don't know where to start. You're not supposed to know where to start. Are you all technologists? Not many people in this room are. Get help. Not necessarily from me, I'm happy to help if I can. But there are plenty of people out there who are thinking about this, who are suppliers to you. So go push your suppliers. If they don't have solutions to help you take advantage of this technology, get new suppliers. But get the help you need to do this, do this change quickly. I do this for a living, I speak about all kinds of things. If you wanna delve into the stuff, I'd be happy to do it with you. Um, you can find me easily, baldfuturist.com. And if you wanna go further into this, I have a book coming, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, I'd be happy to sell you all a copy. Um, if you want to get on a mailing list so you, you get contacted first when it's available, you just have to go and text the word bald right now to 345-345, get you on a mailing list. I'm not gonna hassle you, I don't do that. Um, but when the book comes out, I'll give you a, a, a link to go get it. So I hope this was useful to you. I hope it was thought-provoking. I hope I didn't scare you too much. I'm sorry I've run a bit late. Thank you for your time and attention, and the best of luck to Redmond. I love this place, and I'll be back more and more in the future. So good luck with it all. I hope this is useful. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Great presentation, thank you very much. We've got some time for some questions, but I'll remind you, when we're done with our questions, we're gonna do our drawing. So if you're gonna invest an additional $250 today to enter into the drawing, or you're a new investor of $250, please fill out the pledge card on your table, hold them up, and our board members will come around and pick them up from you. So we have about 15 minutes or so to do some Q&A. Sure. So I will take some questions from the audience, and Larry's out here as well. There's one there in the middle, Larry, and I'll get this one here. Great presentation, Steve. So yeah. um, this is an economic development organization. Uh, talk to us a little bit about um, the, the traditional um, uh, you know, goal of economic development is job creation and economic activity in this changing world of jobs and technology. Um, what should economic development efforts be looking out for? Great question. And it's, I'm very optimistic about the future. That's, that's why I do what I do. Uh, but I'm also cautious about the future, and I, I'm concerned, and I'm realistic about the future. Um, there are a number of organizations, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Oxford University in the UK, uh, McKinsey, that are making pretty dire predictions about what automation will do to jobs. Uh, in 20 to 25 years, the, generally the projections sort of take the average, that up to 50% of jobs will be at high risk of automation in the next 20 to 25 years. That's a big deal. Now, that has always been the case, that new technology has destroyed some jobs. At the same time, new technology creates a bunch of jobs. So there's a study in the UK that says that artificial intelligence will destroy seven million jobs in the UK in the next 25 years. Holy moly, it's a country of like 60 million people. Seven million jobs? This is the end of the world. Well, they also project that AI will create 7.2 million jobs. So, um, as we go through all the automation process, which is inevitable, because in order to remain competitive, we're gonna have to embrace this technology, and we start to think about augmenting the capabilities of our human talent with this technology, we're gonna see a flip in the workplace where up to half of us are gonna have to retrain to do something else. Now that's worrisome. What it means is that if you're in economic development, we need to be unflinching in, uh, in embracing this technology, but also work very closely with educators, um, with career counselors, to help people make this transition. 
because it's going to require perhaps a different set of skills than the jobs that are destroyed. So we're going to have to re-educate people, and we're going to have to help people figure out who they are again. Right? If, if I tell all of you in this room here today, the job that you do today, when you go home tonight, that's the end of your work because that job's been automated. What are you going to do with your life? That's a huge question because work is tied to identity. So I think a lot of what economic development um, organizations can do is to help their businesses that they support understand the benefits of automation, understand how to do automation responsibly. And by that, I mean don't automate away the human value that you have because humans bring a lot of value. Um, so to recognize that, that's why I showed you that process of the, the things going up and down. Recognize the value that the humans bring in your workforce and use automation to elevate human work rather than to replace it. So encourage smart automation, but also partner to build um, re-education capabilities and career counseling capabilities to help people make through this transition. I told you before that you know, we, we move people off the land, work in the land and into offices and factories, and our education system is set up to do that. It's still set up to do that 150 years later. And we moved 90% you know, of the population into offices and factories over a 200-year period. We're now going to move 50% of the population into new roles in a 20 to 25-year period. We've got to rescale and reimagine our education system to do that. So it's a long answer to your question, but you kind of hit to the thing that I really care about. So thank you for the question. Thanks. And great presentation. So uh, you mentioned Oregon. Paisley, Oregon is just a couple of miles that way. 14,300 years ago, the first humans were hanging around in those caves. Uh, they wore, you know, loincloths and they had spears. We're 14,300 years into this right now. What I've seen with technology has been fantastic for my business, but at the same time I've seen uh, the very worst of the naked ape take advantage of that. Skyrocketing medical costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. New technology comes along. The first thing everyone says is, hey, that's great technology. But the first thing the business does behind that is, let's check up the price of that by 3,000%. We're still naked apes. We still like to keep our own meat. We still like to hit things with spears. How do you square everything you've said with that? It, it seems to be a perfect technology in the hands of, you know, a knuckle dragger. Yeah, you just asked the $64 trillion question, which is uh, how do we use technology to make ourselves better humans? And actually, I did a TED talk in 2013, and that was the topic of my, of my talk, is that you know, the, he, technology must make us better humans. And you have to then define, well, what is a better human? And how do you put guardrails on that? Um, we're already starting to see, uh, capitalism is wonderful, um, but we're already starting to see that burst at the edges a little bit where um, we're seeing increasing inequality, and that may continue to be the case if there are no guardrails. And it may mean that we have to not just reimagine our education system, reimagine all of our businesses and the way they operate, but also reimagine capitalism itself to figure out how do we make this work for all of us? Now, there'll be some people in this room who are like, well, screw that. You know, if people are out of jobs, tough. Re-educate yourself. Well, okay, uh, that's fair. Um, I believe in personal responsibility like the rest of us. Um, but if suddenly half of your customers can't afford your product anymore, you're out of business too. So we're all very connected in this. And if we don't use this technology responsibly, we could take down our economy. And so we need to start thinking now about what is what I've started calling the post-automation economy. What does it look like? And how does it work for everybody? How do we help people through this transition? How do we use it to make sure that we don't concentrate power into a few people who maybe misuse it um, and, and make it so that we can still all enjoy our lives? And that is, to me, the number one question that our politicians should be grappling with right now. And I know we have some representatives here in the room. And it's a really tough problem, and politicians often don't talk about things that they don't know the answers to. But we need to start talking about it as a society. And so I don't think this is something we can look at our politicians to and say, you need to fix this. You need to figure this out. This is one of the biggest challenges we've had as a society in the history of humankind. 
we're all in this together, and so I think we all own the responsibility. So for all of you, you've heard this stuff today. I've, I've educated you just a little bit on what the challenges are, what the opportunities are. I deputize you all as futurists, right? Go have these conversations, because this is going to be a cultural conversation, a societal conversation we all have to figure out. You know, if we concentrate, if you take labor and turn it into capital by making a robot, then the person that bought that capital gets all the value and they're no longer paying people. It's kind of an issue that we all have to figure out. So have these conversations at your next cocktail party. When you go back to the office, start to talk to people about what's the world we want to live in. How does it, what does it look like? How do we use automation responsibly? And how do we think about the world that we want? And how do we make it a, a conversation we can all start to have? So I don't have an answer for you because it's a massive question. But we need to start having the conversation about it now. Not, not our politicians, let's not outsource it, let's own it. We all own this problem. So let's start talking about it now. So we got another question back here. And uh, the question that we had over here was answered by Steve because he's very good at... Uh, bringing detail to the answers. But I'll remind people, if you're gonna join the drawing, raise your hand with the card, we'll come pick it up. Larry, you got a question there? Hi. Um, I, first of all, wanna say that I know that for a lot of people who have you know, their feet in the ground, and as a young person, I'm standing here and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is so inspiring and eye-opening, and I know it's scary for a lot of you. So I get that, but this has been really cool for um, me, Good. and I'm sure a lot of my fellow peers here today. But I just wanted to ask, um, I was looking into a job in computer science, specifically software engineering, and you said, oh, but AI is learning to program, and I thought, oh my gosh, there's my job. <laughs> okay, what am I gonna do now? So with that being said, I mean, for a lot of us young people, how would you say we should be looking into kind of future careers? Because I think we're all in that moment in life, we're thinking, okay, what are we going to do? But if everything's, if, evolving and changing so rapidly, yeah. what should we be looking at? Great question, and I'm glad you enjoyed the talk. So it was really aimed at the younger people in the room, because you are the future, right? And the, I always want to invest in, in the younger people, so I'm glad that it resonated with you. Um, it, it's a big question, right? If you're starting your career, or some of the younger ones here thinking, well, what do I do in school? Um, there are really a couple of avenues. It, a lot of traditional jobs will start to go away. Um, and anything that's a very repetitive task, however complex that task, will ultimately be a target for automation. So I have a friend who's a radiologist. He went through medical school for seven years, then did another residency in radiology for another three years, and then did a couple of years after that as a specialist. He knows that his job's done in less than a decade. Because radiology, while it is incredibly difficult for a human being, to read all those charts, look at CAT scans and PET scans, and figure out, is that cancer, is that, you know, what is this? It's something that an AI will excel at. So he knows that it's time to, to do something else. So anything that's very repetitive, no matter how complex the task, doing someone's taxes, for example, um, is gonna get automated. So stick with the careers that involve creativity, um, that involve critical thinking skills, that involve empathy, um, interpersonal communication, leadership, uh, inspiring other, other human beings. Um, anything that is human-to-human -human interaction is going to be around. So paradoxically, it might seem weird that doctors are at higher risk of automation than nurses. Because nurses, you know, if you've ever been in hospital, you know it's the nurses that make your experience good or bad because they're the ones that are bedside, making sure you're okay, doing all of the stuff which is about human-to-human -human connection. So technology uh, jobs are still gonna be good. You will be okay in computer science because coding, doing the fiddly bits of coding, yeah, that might go away. But having the vision for, I want to build a piece of software that does this, I want its interface to be like this, I want it to solve this kind of challenge, that creativity, that critical thinking, is still going to be valuable. It just means that you might talk to the compiler and tell it what you want, and it will just make it happen. Now, if you can understand coding at the basic level and understand what's possible and what isn't, that will help you have a higher quality conversation with the AI compiler, but you'll still be, you'll still be employed. So be thinking about technology jobs, but also be thinking, um, it, strangely, liberal, liberal arts um, schools are going to do much better in the next decade or two. 
because they, um, they support the human skills that will allow you to do critical thinking, to uh, look at systems level uh, approaches. Um, so liberal arts and hardcore tech, golden. That help? Okay. I think that's all we have time for. Let's uh, give it another round of applause. All right, thank for you, everybody. Steve. Appreciate it.